she ended up going to church leadership and outing me and I was removed from my position and ousted from the community, which led to me leaving religion entirely. I left the state. I moved like 600 miles away and, you know, started the long journey of processing that. Hey guys, welcome to No Culty Vibes. I'm your host, Cassie Marie. And in today's video, I'm going to be talking to Haley Osier. Haley and I actually connected on TikTok. One of her videos came across my For You page. We started following each other. We had some things in common in our content. And I heard some of her music and saw that she was releasing a new album called Letting Go. And then her team actually reached out to me and asked if we could collab and if Haley could come on the podcast. And of course, I said yes. I wanted to know all about inspiration behind her album. I really wanted to know what her evangelical to ex-evangelical to realizing it was a cult and being able to share and process through her music was like for her. So of course I wanted to have her on. We set it up and recorded it. So you guys are going to get to hear the whole conversation. A quick intro for those of you that don't know, Haley is an independent pop singer slash songwriter from Nashville with a story to tell. Her music reveals the pain and pining of her first queer love, loss, and betrayal from a post-evangelical perspective. With influences like Sarah Bareilles, Renee Rapp, and Holly Humberstone, Haley explores the depth of her grief with warm, emotive vocals over what she calls a cinematic, moody, sapphic pop soundscape. Haley's album, A Letting Go, was produced by Chase Coy and chronicles the journey of missing someone who hurt you and reckoning with that hurt. The 10 song collection is a poignant reflection of Osher's personal experiences and growth as a queer person who has left behind the faith she once clung to. This conversation was so interesting and fun. I saw a lot of parallels with myself and Haley's story. I actually had no idea that we had so much in common. So you'll hear me talk a little bit about my experiences as well. But mostly we just talk about Haley and what it was like, how she grew up, what church she got involved with and what this ex did to her, which is a crazy story and really nuts how this all went down and inspired this album. So anyway, it was a really fun conversation and I really hope you enjoy it. I'm so excited for this conversation. So Haley Ozier, you have a new album that just came out, right? You're a musician, a pop artist. You came across my For You page on TikTok. Amazing. Not long ago, I think. Yeah. Um, And we started following each other. And I've been following a little bit of your journey leading up to your album release. I really resonate a lot with your story and the things that you've been sharing. So um, on No Culty Vibes, obviously, I talk a lot more about the leaving religion, leaving culty environments. So I'll probably have so many questions for you about what that process was like. But can you tell me a little bit about your album and your music and what inspired this so people can get to know you just a little bit? For sure. So the album is called A Letting Go. And it's about that. It's about letting go uh, of an ex that I had seven or eight years ago now who I was dating on the DL while I was still in the church and she ended up going to church leadership and outing me and I was removed from my position and ousted from the community, which led to me leaving religion entirely. I left the state. I moved like 600 miles away and, you know, started the long journey of processing that and I had not written about it like musically. So when I was making my return to music after seven years of not making any, it was like, this is this is the story that I have to tell. Uh, So the album is me like figuring out how to miss someone who hurt me while dealing with the betrayal and finding myself after leaving the church. Wow, that's a lot. (laughs) That, That is definitely I can imagine writing from that experience would have a lot to dig into. I have listened to the whole album. Yeah. I love it, especially Under, which yeah. <laughs> I love. I love the vibe of that one. That's been my favorite so far. 
Um, so was this person that you were dating, were they in the church that you were in as well? Yeah, we met because I was their small group leader. Um, she like joined my group of other, you know, 20 something women. And um, we like immediately hit it off and became friends who make out. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> So tell me, okay, so tell me a little bit about that, because I was a small group leader in my church, too. My -hmm. husband and I were the young adult leaders when we were in our early 20s. I don't know (laughs) why they would appoint two kids in their early (laughs) 20s that know nothing to be the young adult leaders, but we were. So tell me a little bit about your background and your faith, how you grew up, and what kind of led to your position in the church. Yeah, so I grew up both Episcopalian and, like, Baptist, uh, which, you know, is denominationally confusing. And then when I was old enough to go to church on my own, I went to, like, non-denominational churches. And when I was in college, got into, like, the charismatic faith. And uh, that led me down some wild roads. And (laughs) I ended up in church at Gateway Church in South Lake, Texas, uh, mega church, huge. And their young adult program is also massive. And so I had been leading small groups for like middle schoolers uh, and then decided I wanted to be around people my age, <laughs> lead peer small groups. Um, and so I did. I had had, I think, one year leading this group. And then it, the next year, Sydney joined um, the girl who the album is about. I don't know if I'd said her name yet. The name's on the album, so. Okay, perfect. <laughs> it's like, oh no, we're, we're naming names? <laughs> yeah, she deserves it a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll, yeah, I would say. Um, yeah, that is, that would be theologically very confusing. Yes. Uh, Episcopalian and Baptist being so different. Um, I also got into the charismatic world in college, Amazing. like right around my early college years. I feel like that's when they get you. Yeah, it's the right <laughs> to join a cult and start speaking in yep. tongues. It's time. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So when you, so that experience is what caused you to leave your faith and leave re- religion behind altogether. Yeah, like I had known uh, I was some version of attracted to women since I was 18 and had been in a ton of conversion therapy, um, including exorcisms because I was charismatic. (laughs) That's what we do. We do that too. Yep. Um, So, you know, by the time that happened and uh, even just like getting into that relationship with her um, and having those experiences for the first time. Um, I think, you know, even if I hadn't had the catastrophic removal from the church, ousting from community, uh, I think I would have eventually still left. Um, but yeah, when I left Texas and moved here, I, I never went to church again. Wow. When you left, did you immediately feel like you were leaving a cult-like experience or were you just hurt by that specific community and the deconstruction process? Did that take a bit longer? What was that? What did that kind of feel like for you? When I initially left, it was like, I was still thinking like, this is a, an attack from Satan on my faith. Yeah. <laughs> I was like really <laughs> determined to like, like stay and hold on to some version of faith. Um, but Yeah, I mean, it felt like a house of cards, like, pretty quickly for me. I, like, didn't do a ton of, like, methodical deconstructing. Um, And it took a lot of therapy for me to be able to name the religious leaders as, like, abusers in my life. And then to be able to call not only that church, but all of evangelical Christianity cult-like. Yeah, that's kind of what my I don't know how much you've seen of my story I don't talk about it a whole lot but my journey was similar where we left and I actually recognized some other things in my life as cult-like well before I recognized my church experience as cult-like even as I was deconstructing my faith so my deconstruction also wasn't super methodical my husband started deconstructing first and then 
um, I kind of just started not going along with it, but just having realizations mean like, yeah, why, why do we think that? Why do I think what I think? How do I feel about this? And it wasn't until I really started studying cults that I was like, oh, oh no. <laughs> this all was a cult all yeah. the way back to college and Christianity and charismatic. And I never prayed in tongues. My husband did, but we did we did prophetic ministry and mm -hmm. you were saying earlier in your story that you had like kind of exorcisms. I was given a book. Like when I very first started going to this church, they were handing out these books prophetically. Like God was telling them to give it oh. to random people. And someone gave me a book about deliverance ministry and how to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> Early on, wanted me to be able to do those exorcisms. I could never do that. I was super into the prophetic, mm -hmm. loved prophetic ministry, really drew a hard line at deliverance <laughs> and demons. I was like, I'm not, I'm not your girl with the demons. <laughs> but yeah, it's weird how everyone's journey is different and what that looks like for everybody is different, but it can take a long time to process. Do you feel like you said you stopped writing for about seven years? Did you write music while you were in the church? Were you part of like worship ministry and like things like that? Yeah, I was always a worship leader. Um, and I had two albums out that are not on the internet anymore. Um, I had put out two albums as like a straight Christian girly uh, <laughs> back in the day. Lots of songs about boys I thought I liked. Um, <laughs> That's but, amazing. yeah, I mean, I think that when I left, like it was hard to have a relationship with music, uh, since it was so wound up in like the idea of calling, it was like, what's mm -hmm. the point of doing this? If it's not something that like the God of the universe is calling me to. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. That can be so hard. I also find it difficult when things that are usually our ways of healing and being creative and expressing ourselves get tied up in the cult or in the extreme belief system that we're part of because it can be so I have found with most people that I speak to after leaving a cult that they have some kind of creative practice that really just helps them express and work through what they've been through and also just remember who they are yeah. and what they like not what the group likes and who they want to be. So I would imagine having your creative process specifically tied up so deeply in the faith, it would be hard to sure. do that again. Yeah, what made you my story? Oh, sorry, like, my story is still hard. Uh, Cause that also, I mean, just as like a group leader and as a sort of pastor prophetic person, um, you know, yeah, just storytelling is, is still on that vein for me too of like, how do I do this <laughs> without it meaning something like life changing for the other person? Like, especially I know you, like the prophetic, you know, it's like, what's the point of the things that I'm saying if it's not to completely upend someone's life <laughs> and contribute exactly. to their salvation? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. There's so much, there's so much wrapped up in all of that. Have yeah. you um, heard of the book called The Sunny Nihilist? No. So uh, Amanda Montel wrote a book called Cultish, mm -hmm. The Language of Fanaticism. And it talks about how cults and extreme groups use language a lot. And language is a way that you can tell who's in from who's out. Anyway, it's like one of the first culty books people love to read. But Amanda recommended The Sunny Nihilist written by someone she knows. And it their talk in the book, not about nihilism being like this great thing, but about how sometimes we in our culture assign so much meaning to everything all the time and such deep meaning to everything all the time that sometimes removing that meaning <laughs> from life, from every single little thing can be healthy. And I think yeah. especially as you're deconstructing, it can be healthy. So that's what that kind of reminded me of the sunny side of nihilism as you were talking about that yeah learning to like do things meaninglessly and like to learn how to not know things those two skills yeah 
not have all the answers. Do you have like a moment in your deconstruction, deconstruction journey, leaving the faith where we call it like the shelf breaking moment sometimes in cult recovery, where like you put all of these things that are off to you, or maybe you don't really believe that, but you don't know how to reconcile it. And you put it all on a shelf until like one little tiny thing happens and that shelf breaks and you can no longer ignore all of the things you've been putting away for so long. Did you have kind of a shelf breaking moment and I did. how did you reconcile that? For me, it was uh, reading or learning from other queer Christians who have like done the work um, of figuring out that like, you know, all of the verses we liked to parrot that like are supposedly anti-gay verses are not, <laughs> they're not talking about that at all. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, that's obviously an issue so closely tied to my identity, but it was like once I realized that like um, God, that idea of God would be okay with me being gay, then after that it was like, why do I need this at all? <laughs> like, why am I looking to this text to tell me who it's okay to be or who it's okay to love or yeah, everything fell after that. That's amazing. I love that. That also... I don't mean to keep mentioning like my story and my journey. I just resonate so much with what you're saying and have so many similarities because that was actually my shelf breaking thing too. When I finally was like, Oh, okay. We're fully deconstructed. We're done because I listened to, um, I think a podcast years ago, Jen Hatmaker did that was, uh, like LGBTQ affirming Mm -hmm. and, she went through the hermeneutics of it, but then also interviewed um, B.T. Harmon, I think his name was. She interviewed a queer Christian and his story was so emotional and just broke me. Yeah. And then listening to her go through the hermeneutics of like, this is not actually what any of this means at all. I was like, oh, <laughs> so that means what is my church saying about all this other stuff? And what does all of that actually mean? And then I went into like different ways that people interpreted the Bible for a long time. Yeah. So I think that's, that's a big one because it's just so blatantly false. Right. Like it just isn't, it was never there to begin with. So yeah. Wild, wild. Um, Okay. So you had, that what made you feel like you were ready to write again and what was that process like so (laughs) i had cancer in 2022 oh wow just another bump in the road (laughs) Uh, (laughs) i had uterine cancer and had to get a hysterectomy and um i you know probably rock bottomed and whatever since that happens like after recovery um I like was expecting to just be better and like re-enter life and re-enter the world and I was finding myself feeling stuck and sort of like purposeless um and in that I started missing Sydney my ex uh for the first time in I don't know how many years seven years probably at that point and like that was shocking, <laughs> jarring, hated it. Um, <laughs> but I realized that like I, you know, while I had processed like the abuse she had put me through, the abuse of the church had put me through and like the trauma of it, I didn't really let myself process that it was my first queer relationship and that I like had loved her and been attracted to her. Mm-hmm. I felt like bringing that up in therapy was like, I don't know, making light of the actual like trauma piece of it and I felt like I had needed to focus so much on like the deconstruction aspect um and so in processing that it was like okay I felt like I had a complete picture uh and felt like I could write about it without like a of all getting sucked back into just complete PTSD world Uh, But B of all that I could like finally really see her side of the story. Uh, Not that like 
I don't want to sit here and excuse her behavior, but we were both part of a cult. And, you know, yeah. we both could have made the decision that she made. Uh, she just did it first. I mean, I wouldn't have done it, but <laughs> I can see that now, you know, like I probably, right. yeah. Um, so, you know, I think I had a more well-rounded perspective and had had some life experiences that uh, opened my eyes to more emotion than I was like letting myself feel up until that point. Wow. So then it was just time and yeah. you, you got it all out. Yeah. Uh, so one of the songs, you read an email you wrote to her. Yes. Can you tell me about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in January of last year, January, 2023, I um, had written this album. I hadn't uh, taken it to my producer yet. It was like, just kind of an idea that I was thinking about. And uh, because I had been through the process of writing it and missing her and, you know, I mean, we hadn't talked since she went to the church um, and I wasn't like blocked on anything. So my thinking was like, you know, maybe there's a door open to get some closure. Um, and it's been seven years. Like, I don't know. I think we could probably be adults together about this like we're both in our 30s so yeah I wrote her this like long email uh that was too nice you know like I mean it, <laughs> I was nice I was forgiving yeah. um while also like being direct about like the ways that she had hurt me um and I never got a response <laughs> um yeah. that's wild I will say <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm everybody's crazy ex and I'm okay with it, but um, I ended up finding out that she has come out. So like other people know she's gay. When we were making out, she wasn't even willing to say she was attracted to women, much less to right. me. Like, we're making out as friends, which is not a thing, but that's what the thing was. Right. Um, it is when you're in a cult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so when I found out like that she had come out, I was in the process of recording the album and um, I ended up texting her. So I'd sent the email just to her email address or whatever, but I ended up texting mm -hmm. her um, and basically being like, it was right before the first single had come out lying and was like, Hey, just so you know, like I have this single coming out and this album coming out that is largely inspired by you and our relationship. Didn't want you to be blindsided. Mm -hmm. And then, on everything. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. So then I wrote the fall, which like wouldn't have been on the album without that experience. And I think wow. <laughs> That's unreal. Okay. So I uh, with cults it's really hard for me having researched cults a lot. I understand like what happens to your brain mm -hmm. when you're in a cult, right? And I understand that were such victims of undue influence in that situation. And you can also often have like a cult self and a regular self. And, and there are still certain things that some people don't do even when they're in the cult. And there are some things that people would never do even in that level of undue influence. Yeah. And I know we're totally one-sided here because <laughs> she's not here to have her side of the conversation. But to be fair, she blocked you on everything, so how could she? had an opportunity. <laughs> yes. That's just, the whole thing from start to finish is just objectively rude, yeah. in my opinion. And also, like, who? I just can't even imagine. I cannot imagine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, her blocking me on everything is what, like, uh, that first line of the fall, just like that, you bring me back again, like, to feel her shame, like, that was that was that experience for me. It like really brought me back to that room where they fired me. Um, wow. Because I was like, damn, like you're still, you're still on this. Like you still think that I'm a perpetrator in this situation. Yeah. Wild. That is crazy. I mean, also she probably knew what she did. <laughs> yeah. You know, like she probably was like, oh, that's not going to be good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, especially if she's come out, it's like, yeah, you got to reckon with, I mean, I had to, like, I mean, I was in conversion therapy, but I perpetuated conversion therapy also, you know? So when I came out, I, like, did an apology to her being like, sorry, I told you you were sinful for 
thinking this. Yeah, I had to do a lot of similar things. There are a lot of things in both of the very culty situations I was in that I felt like are things I wouldn't have done had I not been in that situation and things I really regret and feel bad for. And you have to own them. Yeah. And like work through them and and own up to it and apologizing would be nice. I mean, I don't know if I can say blanket, <laughs> we always all have to apologize, but I feel like that's a good step in the yeah. owning and working through. So sounds like maybe there's some things she still doesn't want to. Yeah. I think take. she's probably still a Christian. Maybe. Yeah. So. Yeah. And there's, and obviously, like you said earlier, there is a lot there that would be hard to face and work through. And yeah, there is the cult aspect, but uh, it's just something my brain like latches onto all the time. I'm like, okay, but yeah. how much do we. For sure. Experience? Putting out this album was like one last ditch effort to get her attention and give her a chance to be like. Right. Say anything. <laughs> anything. <laughs> And we have some closure. And <laughs> closure <laughs> would be nice. Yeah. Uh, so what has the experience been like writing and releasing and like sharing this story with the world and with the internet? It's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, part of that is like I like when I first came out of the church, I was so online in the evangelical community and then got some distance from it because I needed to. Yeah. Um, and so to sort of like put myself back in this where like this is part of the my daily conversation has been weird just because, you know, I think we all reach a point in deconstruction where like we don't have to talk about it as much as we were probably talking about it when it was the thing. Right. Um, so that's been kind of weird, but it's been great to see, like, well, great in, and also heartbreaking to know that, like, so many people relate to my experience. I mean, there have been so many queer people who have been outed by partners, like, specifically, oh um, which is just, like, wild and I think really, like, nails home the cult experience of, like, people who love each other being not willing to betray each other. Yeah. To serve... Yeah, the cult is like wild. Um, but you know, it's nice to not feel like alone in that experience. And I'm really glad that the album is out and like I'm not like the sole owner of it anymore. Like these are not just my stories. Now they get to like live with other people and other people can they're gonna, you know, take a life of their own now. Um, and it's not gonna just be about Sydney. <laughs> um right. it's about me, like it's gonna be about these other people, um, which I love. So that's amazing. That was going to be like my other question is I feel like when we create art, especially in our like from our experiences and our emotions and our healing, it's really cool to see other people find their own meaning in that. That might not be the exact thing that you were writing about, but they still resonate in some way and then also interpret it in a different way. So I was going to ask if people have kind of. For have their sure. Own interpretations recording the album my producer is a cishet man uh he, he doesn't know um, he has like had the experience of like having grown up in the church and like then gotten distance from it but um beyond that like he doesn't have any like experiential connection to this work so even just like in the process of recording the album getting to see what the songs mean to him um sending them to like my straight friends and being like what does this mean to you? <laughs> like, um, yeah, it has been cool. And like, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, once the whole internet gets their hands on it, it's going to take on a whole other life. Yeah, that's amazing. I was thinking earlier when you were talking and you were mentioning that this was born out of missing Sydney and that being such a weird feeling because you were so hurt. That resonates with me as like missing the church. Mm -hmm. or missing religion and missing Jesus sometimes yeah. too. Cause like every once in a while it'll hit me and I'll be like, I miss that relationship that I thought I had with this Jesus th person, whatever it was every once in a while I get a wave of like, I miss 
that thing. And it feels so weird, especially when you don't even believe it's real. Yeah. And yeah. So it's like this thing that, that hurt so bad um, yeah. and hurt other people so bad. And then why, like, what's, why do we still miss it? So a lot of your lyrics and stuff resonated with me in that way too, which I found super interesting, especially because you have both of those yeah. experiences in that. There's a song on the album called Wish You Were Here, which is the only song on the album that's not about Sydney. It's about my ex-best friend who like is still at Gateway, uh, which is why we're not friends anymore. Um, she like chose to stay at the church and be in leadership. She's like you guys where her and her husband are like the young adult, like marriage, young married, I don't know, pastor people. Yeah. Um, and like it's it's that experience of like missing her, but knowing like I'm not gonna reach out. Like that's not gonna be a good relationship for me. She's mm -hmm. deeply down the rabbit hole, like homophobic, transphobic, conservative. It's a mess. Yeah. But I still miss her. Like I still wish she was here to experience all of this with me. Like she's the first person I think of when I have something good going on still. Yeah. But it is so weird. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> this cult recovery experience. You also mentioned briefly that like you've been out of the ex-evangelical community a bit. Like you felt like that was really important for you and you were like super in it for a while and now you're not. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about that? What? Why is that? Let's see if I can talk about it without offending like a ton of people. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone we're speaking to on this podcast. <laughs> No, you're good. I think it's important. That's why I asked because I think I have a feeling why that yeah. might be. So. Like, so I was like really into it on Twitter back in the day. And um, it just turned out that like most of the people and communities that I like found myself in were just like fundamentalism 2.0. Um, they like left behind the specific dogma of evangelical Christianity and they decided to stick with being fundamentalist. Um, and there was like, you know, a lot of like grifting going on too. Like everybody was trying to sell a book or, you know, be the final word and authority on something, which again was what we had just left. Or I thought we had all just left it. Like I thought that was all wrapped up in why we didn't like being in a cult. Um, you know, so yeah, I felt like people were still trying to grasp for having undue influence on other people. Uh, <clears throat> and then I met a guy in that group and dated him and it was an abusive mess. And so <laughs> oh, no. not to sour like an entire group of people. <laughs> no. So the reason that I ask, and I don't think, hopefully I think that people can hear your experience and understand like where that might come from because, and I think people are starting to talk about that a little bit more within the community. Yeah. I've heard some of the like bigger names mention it recently and I hadn't ever heard anyone acknowledge that before, like right. literally this past year, I would say. So I think that a lot of people are going to still resonate with what you're saying and I have found that ex cult communities. Oh no, I'm getting all kinds of notifications. Sorry for the dings, guys. Um, I've noticed that many ex cult communities can get really messy, and especially like ex, -vangel ex evangelical, the way you described it as still fundamentalist. I very much feel that way, and I think that cult hopping is a thing. And that was something I experienced. I was in an MLM and then my culty church and then in like the business coaching grifter world, yeah. which was where I ultimately had the worst, most con high control cult experience. Um, and if you don't deconstruct how you were in that belief system, not just what you believed, but why and how and what a cult is and what undue influence is and coercion and all that stuff. If you don't understand that, you just end up doing the same exact thing with a different set of beliefs. Yeah. So I think that it's a good thing. I'm glad more people are starting to talk about it. I think us sharing our experiences in that environment 
can be good and for people to just be aware like hey it's really yeah. easy to just jump right into the next thing and have a very similar experience and it's i think a lot of us like do social justice issues tend to get so wrapped up in that too and like that plus black and white thinking which is like the only thinking mm -hmm. we're taught when we're indoctrinated into christianity like can get so sticky yeah Absolutely. I heard, I want to say Daniela Mestinick Young said this. Have you heard of her before? She was so. in the children, she was in the children of God cult. Mm -hmm. And when she left, went and joined the army and had a whole experience there. And her book is about the similarities between the children of God cult and the army. And she went on to study group behavior mm -hmm. and cults from like a group perspective and a group um, like organizational perspective, not necessarily psychology or sociology. Anyway, I explained all of that to say that I think she said one time that if you just go from trying to do something that's not achievable in this lifetime, like in your cult, we are all given this like afterlife goal, especially yeah. evangelical. The whole point is to get everyone to this afterlife goal and it's not achievable in this lifetime. We won't get the rewards until we are not here anymore. And that's so easy to replicate in something else like social justice yes. or like getting everyone to leave the evangelical community and become ex-evangelical or to get everyone to at least see things that the way that you see it. Yeah. If your goal is to save everyone, heal everyone, get everyone out or make sure everyone is doing the right thing, then you're still in a cult. You're yeah, still doing I still think you have the answer for everyone and everything. And I think there's something too also like I mean being indoctrinated from a young age, like you're told that you have like a special mission and you're like indwelled with this spirit and like you're special, you're something special. And that's like not something anybody wants to deconstruct when it's definitely not the first thing you want, think to deconstruct when you're leaving the church. You don't want to not be special. Um, so that, you know, carries over into, yeah, like your your work, your mission, your purpose post evangelicalism, if you're not careful, then yeah, I mean, you're still on the track to become a cult leader. Yeah. <laughs> you're so special. Yes. So have you coming back and having your album and releasing it, are you finding a lot of those same issues or do you think you're kind of finding a groove and finding more of a community that you kind of resonate more with this time around? Yeah, I think that my priorities have shifted, um, especially like becoming friends with my producer who like doesn't engage in the ex-evangelical community, but still has the lived experience. Um, you know, there was like a laundry list of things that I thought I was looking for in friends and community when I left the church. And like on the top of that list was like, has all of the exact same values. I mean, you know, <laughs> I couldn't be <laughs> friends with non-Christians when I was a Christian. So like, I didn't know how to do anything except for like strictly value-based friendship and community. Um, and now, yeah, being able to engage with the ex-evangelical community, um, having like new priorities has been better. Like I don't find myself getting swept up in needing the approval of the community. I can like stand on the truth of my story and like my current worldview without feeling like I owe people over explanation or um, some sort of like hermeneutic process of like, this is how I got here. Um, Cause I think I used to be pretty tied up in that too of like, I don't believe in this because, and then going through the whole, <laughs> here's what this verse yeah. looks like Hebrew. <laughs> I don't feel the need to do that anymore. <laughs> um, yes just like a much less stressful way to engage um, with this community. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I feel, I feel, I feel uh, like I've contributed something of like meaning to doing this album. It's not just like parroting the same things that we're always talking about on the internet. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> it is a very unique experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I feel good standing behind that instead of just, yeah, like the top speaking points of like all of ex-evangelicalism. I love that. And I think that's like, that makes a huge difference. And like, if we're gonna, like to not alienate the ex-evangelical and what we were kind of saying about hermeneutics, I feel like that's a natural progression that we all oh, go through. Sure. Like especially I had especially leaving. Yeah. yeah, like especially because evangelical is so fundamentalist. There had like there's often just kind of steps out of that that are so normal. And it is really freeing to take that next step. Right. Out. Like yeah. just as freeing as it is to look at all of that, and this is why I believe differently, it's also so freeing. To yeah. step completely out and be like, huh, what is it like to not wrap up my whole brain <laughs> in what this culture is and what this book says? Yeah. Wild. Okay. So is there anything else specific that you want people to know about the album or um, where they can find you or what you help people get out of it? Any we final? Really are on thoughts? all the platforms. Um, <laughs> really one of the only ones, which is nice. Um, yeah, I mean, I just want people to listen to it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it is so good. I've literally been listening to it for days. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it on repeat, so. <laughs> I love that. I love when I create something. Sometimes in the middle of creation, like the messy middle, you're like, oh my gosh, I hate this. What am I doing? This isn't even going to be good. Like what's happening? And then when I finish, I'll look at it and I'm like, wow, I'm a genius. I'm a creative mastermind. This is so yes. good. And I like appreciate all my hard work. So I, I would also listen to my own album. <laughs> I'm definitely going to be like my own top artist on Spotify this year. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me and being on the podcast. And Thanks for having me. Yes. Thank you so much for listening. Like I said, before we got started with the conversation, I had no idea that Haley and I had so much in common and there were a lot of things about her story that I didn't know. So we chatted a little bit after this recording and I want to have her back on to chat a little bit about her experience in conversion therapy and just a little bit more into the nitty gritty of what the culty evangelical church was like for her. So we're going to get that scheduled at some point. She said she would love to chat about that. So keep an eye out for another episode with Haley. I'll see you next time on No Culty Vibes. And until then, don't be culty.